knifing its way through the sunlit waters of the Solent, the hydrofoil brings yet more people to cows on the Isle of Wight for a week that will be hard to forget. The first week in August is Cows Week, the most famous yachting regatta in the world. And on this occasion, the Admiral's Cup races are also being held, attracting teams of yachts from all over the world. It's no wonder then that the pretty River Medina is jam-packed with boats of all sizes and descriptions. In a boat, there's always a lot for the crew to do, provided they're not distracted. A top-class racing yacht has to be meticulously prepared, as this Canadian crew knows full well. I don't know where I'm going, I just follow the guy in front. The longer races mean several days at sea, so there's a mass of supplies to get on board, not forgetting some liquid refreshment. Any dirt or weed on the hull would slow the boat down, so the bottoms of these large yachts are polished as lovingly as any family car. There's more than one way of polishing a bottom, of course. If you prefer, you can just sit in the sun and watch other people working. As the time for the first race draws near, the yachts slip down river one by one. Yachts come in all shapes and sizes, so there's an elaborate handicapping system to allow them to race together. King's Steps, landing place for the hallowed Royal Yacht Squadron. A good place to see and be seen. The Royal Yacht Squadron is the nerve centre for the racing in Cows Week. It's here that the races are started and all the records are kept. Yachts jostle for position on the starting line while they wait for the gun to go. For the big boats, the first event of Cows Week is the Channel Race sailed over a 200-mile course across the English Channel to the coast of France and back again. As a sailing yacht averages four or five knots, that means the best part of two days at sea. With 200 starters, there's quite a crowd at the line, each boat trying to get an advantage. Even in a two-day race, seconds can be vital. To save weight, this yacht, Irish Mist, even has holes cut in her aluminium main boom. Edward Heath in his latest morning cloud. 
Every other year, the Admiral's Cup races are held during Cowes Week. They were set up to attract foreign yachts to compete in British waters. Each country sends a team of three yachts, and so far, over 20 countries have taken part. The Admiral's Cup was established in 1957. Since then, Britain has won it six times, America twice, and Australia and Germany once each. After the pressure of the start, the crews settle down into the routine they'll be following for the next two days. Watch and watch. Four hours sailing the boat as fast as she'll go, and four hours off to snatch a bite to eat and some sleep. A yacht can't sail directly into the wind, and so it has to tack from side to side, zigzagging its way to windward. As the boat turns from one tack to the other, it slows down, and vital seconds can be lost if it's not done properly. This is how it should be done, quickly, smoothly, and with minimum loss of speed. As night begins to fall, the 200 yachts, scattered now, forge on in the gentle breeze on their way to France and back. Dawn, two days later, and the competitors in the Channel race motor back to Cowes after crossing the finishing line in the dark. As cows wakes up to another lovely day, it's time to dry sails and clothing, air the bedding, and generally clean up after a couple of days at sea. And all over the harbour there's the tantalising smell of bacon, as 200 yachts prepare a well-earned breakfast. Inevitably, there are running repairs to make. All the major sailmakers and suppliers of other equipment set up shop in cows for the week to give the quick service that top-class international racing demands. For the boats on the Channel Race, this is a rest day. After all the essential jobs have been done, what could be better than a rest? The modern craze for jokey t-shirts. Easy to handle. I wonder. While it was a rest day for the big yachts, the smaller day boats and racing dinghies were out in force. In fact, this sort of racing is just as important a part of Cow's Week as the more glamorous and expensive ocean racing. The week is organised jointly by all the yacht clubs in the Cow's area who use the Royal Yacht Squadron's facilities for starting and finishing the races. During the week, Cow's sounds rather like an artillery range. People who like to sleep in on Sunday mornings are catered for, though. Before lunch, they don't fire the big guns, only little ones. Have you seen the others?
I think they went that way, actually. The Solent has been recognised as an ideal place for pleasure boats for centuries. It used to be a rich man's game, and when it comes to big boats, it still is. But for many, many thousands of people, small boats like these are the ideal means for taking their pleasure afloat. As the guns of the racing program fall silent, the equally important social program gets underway. The social climber would dearly like to split himself in four because there are parties going on everywhere. At sunset, the flags come down. The Royal Yacht Britannia gulps hers down the funnel. The ships lying off cows switch on their floodlights. In the soft summer darkness, even guns can look pretty. Eight o'clock the next morning, the bugles sound and the flags go up again. The Royal Yacht is the Duke of Edinburgh's floating palace for the week, and every morning he sets off for a day's sailing. Prince Philip has chartered the 40-foot Yeoman 19 for the whole of Cow's Week. No one really knows how Cow's came by its name. Perhaps there was a sandbank nearby called the Cow just as there's a bullock patch and a horse sand to this day. But most historians think that the name comes from two forts built by Henry VIII to protect the Solent by cowing any possible attacker. After their day off, it's back to work for the offshore yachts, but this time for short races of 30 miles or so in the Solent. Now the perfect summer weather is almost too perfect. There's not enough wind, and the great gay spinnakers can barely fill as the yachts struggle against the tide. It all looks very peaceful, but these conditions are just as demanding on the crews as a gale of wind. The boat needs complete concentration to coax every possible inch of forward progress. Strong tides and light winds can make a boat difficult to control, though it's usually only the paintwork that suffers. Ted Heath was one of many to have problems during the week. I say, the fellows actually run aground. But Morning Cloud was soon off the mud and back in the competition. Here's one backbench that Mr. Heath is happy to sit on. At the end of the day, when the results have been posted, some boats have reason to celebrate. The Brazilians in Wawa 2 hadn't done particularly well, but felt it was time for a party anyway. On the other hand, Norima, one of the leading British boats, had done well. So her skipper, Ron Amy, and his crew were on top of the world. <laughs> the climax of the social scene is the very, very grand Cow's Week Ball. Anyone without a ticket is nobody, my dear, just nobody. 
Ever since Queen Victoria, there's been a strong royal connection with cows. Perhaps the best known shop of all is Beacon, originally just the local chemist, now the most famous yacht photographer in the world. Since 1880, four generations of Beacons have taken over 55,000 photographs. It's not surprising that in this holiday town, all the local traders are only too keen to jump on the Cow's Week bandwagon. But in the end, it's the visitors that give cows its holiday air. The pushing, bustling, strolling, smiling, crowded, cheerful people, all determined to enjoy themselves as they move through the narrow streets. said a policeman's lot is not a happy one. Out in the Solent, the QE2 slides by, outward bound for New York. That gun again for the start of another race, once more sailed in very little wind. Offshore racing must be the worst spectator sport in the world. Even when the yachts sail relatively short courses near land, it takes an expert eye to see what's going on. But most of the races are sailed over hundreds of miles, day and night in all weathers, far out of sight of land. Add to this an elaborate handicapping system, so that the first yacht to finish is hardly ever the winner, and you can see why ocean racing is unlikely to supplant match of the day. The crewmen whose job is to wind the winches rejoice in the name Gorillas. It's an easy job in these light conditions, but when it's blowing half a gale, they have to live up to their name. The British have been sailing for pleasure for centuries, but the first formal yacht club, now the Royal Cork Yacht Club, was set up in 1720. The Royal Yacht Squadron itself was founded in 1812. 
The early yachts were modelled on the fast ships of the day, small warships or smuggling vessels. They often carried guns, and it's said that one irate owner actually opened fire on a competitor who had beaten him to a mark. Rounding a mark calls for skill, judgment and a cool head, especially when the wind is light, the tide is strong and there are a lot of other boats around. Vital seconds can be saved by shaving it as closely as possible. If you hit the mark, you have to go round it again, and if you hit another boat, you're disqualified. Irish mist breaks out her enormous spinnaker. They're made of very light nylon and in recent years have been getting more and more colourful. Each boat has its own design, which is handy for picking out your rivals at a distance. For the crews, it's another slow, frustrating race in light airs, but the fleet makes a magnificent spectacle. Then perhaps it should, as all the offshore yachts in Cowsweek cost something like £10 million altogether. It seems a lot of money to pay for going so slowly. Offshore racing really began in 1925 with the formation of the Royal Ocean Racing Club, which still administers the sport in Britain. The rules of racing and for working out each boat's handicap are internationally agreed, so that boats from any country can race together. In this fleet, there are at least 20 different nationalities. At one place in the Solent, there's a line of piles sticking out into the water. Most of the fleet sailed prudently around them. But a New Zealand yacht, Inca, slipped through a gap, saving herself a hundred yards or so. Later on, two boats tried the same trick at the same time and got stuck in the gap like two portly gentlemen in a narrow doorway. For its devotees, ocean racing is a fascinating sport. It calls for great skill and concentration like any other sport. Navigation has to be exact. Complicated tactical decisions have to be made. Even cooking a meal with the boat heeled over at 30 degrees bouncing from wave to wave calls for no little skill. Cow's Week is nearly over. And to ring down the curtain, there's a fabulous firework display. Not all the nightlife in cows is upper crust. The chip shops do a roaring trade and the pubs are bursting at the seams. Later the town falls quiet, but not the yacht moorings. The Brazilians have decided to have yet another party. And 
some party it turns out to be. Perhaps with a hangover or two, the crews set off on the classic fastnet race. From Cowes, along the south coast of England to Land's End, across to the fastnet rock just off the southern tip of Ireland, and then back to the finish at Plymouth, over 600 miles in all. The race can take anything from five days to over a week, depending on the conditions. And so Cow's Week is over for another year. Seven long, hot, golden days. The sort of week that usually only exists in your childhood memories when it seemed as though the sun shone all the time. Seven days in summer. The sea, the sun, the fun of sailing. Thank goodness it happens every year. <laughs> 